Hello and welcome to Sugar, Silk and Stretch, a unique boxing podcast brought to you exclusively by Ace Podcast Nation. My name is Ben Doughty. My name is Michael Silka Lajide. And I'm Gary Stretch. And we are collectively delighted to be joined by former British Super Bantamweight champion and world title challenger, Richie Wenton. Richie, how's it going? Hello, guys. A pleasure meeting you, by the way. So, is um, it's not too bad. Life's life, but it's. It, I just feel a bit honoured with Gary Stretch, Michael Adjad, and um, obviously Ben and yourself. We've been friends for a long time on social media, Richie. You know, we don't communicate that often, but we've had this kind of kinship and this bond. You know, as boxing people on social media, so it is really. Um, there's something we spoke about recently, a little project we we, we embark on with, with your blessing. Maybe we'll tell the audience about that at the end. But um, you know what? Taking an interest in your story for reasons that will become clear in due course, I didn't know until this week that your father Terry was a distinguished amateur who actually boxed amateur for 26 years. Yeah, he was, he was a great fight to me, Dad. But um, sort of. I think he, he never t he never got the opportunity to turn professional. Um, he used to spar with, with great fighters like the Alan Rudkins of the world and yeah. people like that. Um, but as I say, he, he sort of um, didn't get the opportunities because of life. Did he train you as growing he up? He trained us as kids. We used to spar as kids. And he, me, me and my brother, Nigel, he boxed in Shambe Mitchell. Down yeah. in, um, he boxed in. He boxed some great fighters. Mm -hmm. um, but as I say, we, we used to train as kids yeah. in the lounge. We used to put, put the settees out the way <laughs> and in the living room. We used to put a boxing gloves on. And we so he trained you. So, so he didn't train you to compete. He just had you guys get interested in it and then you went to a, a club and boxed with somebody else? Well, he, absolutely. We, we did train, but he, from the age of seven and eight, we went to the gym. We <laughs> couldn't really go out after school. We were straight on a bus, straight down and waited outside the gym um, for it to open. When it opened, we'd be in the gym at seven and eight, training, sparring in Liverpool. Yeah. Well, um, because your dad uh, boxed for the Golden Gloves Club. I'm aware of yes. that. But you didn't go to that club. There's a, there's a whole bunch of strong clubs in Liverpool. But you uh, mostly box out the you and your brothers mostly box out the Wavertree ABC. Well, well, we started off in Wavertree and then we we, we jumped to um, well I got beat against a guy named John Naylor. He beat me twice and I won thirteen fights. So I had thirteen fights, thirteen wins, and I boxed some kid in Liverpool and he, his name was John Naylor, great fighter, and he beat me twice in a row. So I assumed we end up joining that gym. <laughs> we ended up joining the gym, which was called St. Ambrose at the time. It's Gemini now in Speak. Yeah, so we ended up joining them. that gym because if you can't beat them, you might as well join them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I said at the time when you told me that on the phone, it had shades of Dennis Andrews and Tommy Hearns with the Cronk gym, you know, <laughs> um, when he uh, ended up going over to the other side of the Atlantic and thinking, well, whatever it is that you've got, you're able to destroy me like that. I'd like to know some of that. But, um, Let's uh, let's try and bring Gary in early doors in case it, we'll talk about the amateurs still before we get into the, the main body of the story. Um, anything on your mind, Gary? No, I'm very very um, honoured to be on the show with Richie because uh, I followed his career and um, um, you know I'm always proud of one of my own. We're only yep. about ten miles apart, and uh, <laughs> in the big scheme of the world, we're we're together. You know, so. Um, yeah, it, he was a a really what I call an honest fighter. What you see is what you get, and uh, always went to fight. And uh, and uh, yeah, it's a it's a great pleasure to 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 to, to listen to his stories tonight because uh, I'm sure he's got a few. So the both of you, you never sparred. You guys, no, a little yes, bit far apart. But as I say, um... go on, sorry, go on. But I, yes, I was obviously brought up on side. But once um, amateur, I had an underneath amateur fights. So I lost about 13, in yeah. give or take. And then I just, when I was 17, 18, moved over to, well, we trained over in Northern Ireland with Barry McGuigan and um, yeah. Barney, Barney Eastwood's camp. Yes. And um, we sort of escalated from there, moved on from there because they had, proper, they had great fighters in that gym. Paul Hodgkinson was there. 
Yes, game won the tournament. Not the scouser. Yeah. You know, I mean, there, there was like. Five... How, old, how old are you, Rich? How old are you? Because I, I fought alongside Hodgkinson a lot. In fact, we shared in 1988. I got British Boxer of the Year. And Hodgkinson shared it with me. It's the first time they shared it with two guys. It was me and him. The Hocko, they call him, right? But um, yeah. I think you're a little bit younger than me, though, right? Well, I probably look about 45, which is nice, you know, but uh, I'm... I'm 56, which is great, you know. Ah, so yeah, two years behind me, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. They're very much the same generation, really. Um, yeah. The, yeah. The, you must have sparred with Barry McGuigan, obviously, and done and done a lot of rounds of him. Well, funny enough, no. I mean, I've got the list of fighters that I've sparred. I mean, McGuigan had just left just then when I moved on there. McGuigan just left East West okay. Gym. The, uh, and yeah, went to a different gym. Now, Jimmy Tibbs. When he, did he go to Jimmy Tibbs? He went to Jimmy Tibbs afterwards, that post Eastwood part of his career. Yes, he did. Okay. Well, funny enough, I've, uh, he, he, he tra he's actually trained me for one of fights. I've had about over two dozen trainers. Yeah. I Because I, um, I had Jimmy Tibbs, I had Glyn Rhodes, I had Brendan Ingle. Yeah. I had, I, 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 see, when you fought Barrera, Glyn Rhodes was in the corner. Glyn Rhodes, yes. a Sheffield expo, was probably a familiar name to Gary, who tried, and, you know, he trained Harold Graham after Harold had the fallout with Brendan Ingle. So, it, it, is, it will be interesting. I don't know if we're getting ahead of ourselves, but I know it might be interesting. I think Michael would yeah. find this interesting too. Yeah, yeah, to talk yeah, about did. fighters who did a lot of trainer hopping. You had I some did. fighters who were... Learning, I, you know, I, I didn't train a lot, but I had a similar role to Richie because I, I went from... Um, I trained with a guy called Gary Davidson at the Beckett when I turned, yeah. and then I went yeah. to Bobby Neal. Yeah. Then I went to Johnny Clark, and then I went to Jimmy Tibbs, and then I went to Freddie Roach. So, you know, I had five, I think, um, ma major trainers, of all of which brought a different different angle to my game. Um, Richie, when you when you went to Brendan, did, did, did you, um, you... You went and stayed in Sheffield, right? Well, I was actually... I'll tell you what happened. I actually moved to Devon from Liverpool um, and started training in Devon, but there's not, not, not many decent boxing gyms down there. But I did have a gym down there in, in Biddyford with Dickie Casey in Biddyford, North Devon. But there wasn't that many sparring partners. Sparring was, I had to get people out. The lads were getting people out the pubs, dorming out the pubs for me to spar. <laughs> and I was thinking, bloody hell, like, you know. So I ended up going to London, training in London with people like Dean Powell and the Thomas Abbott. Yeah. Dean and Powell was, was an interesting character, yeah. you know, Michael. Dean Powell <laughs> never boxed in his life. But what he did was he used, he started sweeping up at the Thomas and Beckett, which was an iconic gym in South London. And then he just worked his way up. He got in with the right people. He shadowed Jimmy Tibbs for a while. I know at the Royal Oak and Canning Town. And the next minute he became this big mover and shaker in the industry. He was Frank Warren's matchmaker for many years. And he did train fighters. When Amir Khan left his trainer um, and was looking for a new trainer, he trained one of those fights with Dean Powell. And... Um, he ended up committing suicide. Sadly, he threw himself on the track at, uh, on a tra under a train track on a, a London underground sort of a London intersection. Wow. Um, but it was one of those people. People. Some people used to say Dean, Bo Dean Powell doesn't know boxing from badminton, and you know that old the snobbery. They say he's never been in there. He's never boxed. Whereas other people say he knew the game intricately well. But what was your take on that, uh, Richie? Uh, okay. Well. Oh my God. Shut well, I'll tell you what. I, I thought Dean Powell was an fantastic trainer he's put in top six in the trainers yeah. I, had, I had something like at least 30 trainers from Eddie really? Shaw right down to Brendan Ingle right down to Dave Caldwell was my last trainer but um, yeah. you know I, I trained everywhere I had something like I had plenty of um, exposure to the, learning off these of these trainers and what they knew I was just rubbing off but the main place I learned my trade was in Northern Ireland. And um, what was, happened is, The Eastwood camp, yeah? Yeah, the Eastwood camp. Do you know what Eastwood used to do? BJ Eastwood, do you know what used to do? We had Eddie Shaw, John Breen, and um, great trainers there, Bernardo Checker. Well, we're in there, we're training in the, in the gym. Eastwood used to fly in people like Sayo Mambi. Do you remember Sayo Mambi? Sayo Mambi, of course. And, and Silk will know him. So, so, I'll, so I'll, be, I'll be sparring with Sayo Mambi. What a lovely, lovely guy. Yes, he yeah. was getting on. 
But yeah. he'd come in, he'd be teaching us what we what we knew. So you know, clever. people like Hilario Zapata. Do you remember Hilario Zapata? Hilario Zapata, yeah. What a fantastic fighter. The, probably the most the best defensive fighter I've ever been in a ring with. Yeah. You know, because I, I, I was stuck in the gym. I'll be sporting. Richie, let, let me ask let you, Richie. Richie. Richie, if I could ask you a question. Let us soak in. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Um, so as an amateur... You didn't have a lot of success as an amateur, you're saying, but you had great success as a pro. No, he had a lot of success as an amateur. No, he won most of the time. I won won absolutely everything I wanted to win as an amateur. Um, But in senior, I didn't really... I boxed for England, but the ABA has always got beat against one or two guys. Like One was um, someone called... What's his name? John Davidson. Yeah, was a really yeah. tough fighter, and I always got beat with him twice in the ABAs. And I never re- entered after that. I just thought, well, I'll just turn pro or something like that. So, which I did, and I learned the trade over there. I mean, right. spawn someone like Hilario Zapata. I mean, Victor Cordova. You've got um, you've got mm-hmm. some great Dave Boy McCall, who's world champion. I was terrified every day. I used to go into the gym, yeah, and I'd have to do four, five, six, seven rounds with, with them. And yeah. they wouldn't go easy on you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's not just jab and move. And mess. You but did you, did you learn because somebody told you what to learn and what to do? Or did you just learn through the experience? Okay. I mean, I learned me trade as an amateur from, the, from give or take 11 years of age all the way up to till I was 18. Yeah. And um, I won national schoolboy titles. I won a couple mm. of them. Um, yeah, I, understand. I understand that part. But I mean, like when you were working with these guys that were – you know, these world-renowned world fighters class. really in the fight yeah. world. Did you learn from them from the whole experience and not, not consciously or was it a conscious um, decision like that was to drop the phone? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's blackout. Yeah, sorry. sorry, did you hear us? Yeah, uh, just missed some of it. I just fell, yeah. fell off the okay. stand. Yeah, um, basically, uh, Ben, you could tell him what I was saying. Yeah, it, it was saying, when you said you learned so much in those years in the Northern Ireland camps, sparring with world-class guys like Cordoba and Zapata, do you feel that you learned because of the way you've been t- taught and instructed, or did you learn by osmosis just from that great experience? I learned quite a lot. Um, can, can I just miss that question? Because I'm just trying to hold this camera. No, it wasn't that. It was just, I just thought you'd understand Ben easier than me. Go on, say it again, Ben. Sorry about that. A different yeah, just, sorry. In English, in I French. think he was saying, did you did you learn more? You know, because some people learn from what trainers are teaching them, and they swear by a particular coach and their and their method methodology. And some fighters say no, they just learn by being around great fighters. They learn by osmosis, just from the experience. Which Thank one you. of us called okay. your? Okay, well, I, I I won't say either. I'll say what I learned off was getting in a ring with the guys, learning off them, watching them. I mean, I was in a gym one day, and one of the lads, Elano Sapate. Was on the speedball. He's hitting the speedball. We we're just hitting the speedball normally. He's yeah. hitting the speedball with his elbows in his head. Yeah. And it's still That's spinning around. around. I'm thinking, wow. You know, learning little trips like that. Obviously, he's skipping. He's doubling up. He's tripling up. He's crossing over. And we just thought, but you learn that when you're sparring people like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The guy was a, a great fighter. He'd slip, move. I mean, Francisco Arroyo was another fantastic Panamanian fighter. Yeah. There let was a ask, connection yeah, between yeah. the the Northern let Irish lot and the Panamanians. Let yeah, me ask Richie, sorry, a quick question. I was always a, a student of the game, meaning you know I, I wanted to learn, and I was you know I, I was always my my biggest objective was to learn, and 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 so you you go through coaches. I I went through five maybe, but. You went through a lot more. My biggest trauma, I think, in my career was leaving coaches that I got attached to, even though I felt like I've run my course and and to be a better fighter, I've got to move somewhere else and learn more. But I had trauma. To this day, I still have regrets that I think maybe a couple of the, like Johnny Clark, I loved. Like he was, he was such a beautiful human being. And I still have trauma thinking when I left him, did it hurt him? You know, did it hurt his feelings? Because, like, I, w- I would, I think it, I would rather lose a fight than hurt my trainer's feelings. And 
and I have regret for um, not regret. You know, I had to try and evolve as a fighter, but I had regret that you know, but this loyalty thing. How how did you deal with a constant movement of trainers and leaving them? When because they do get attached to us, you know. Absolutely. I mean, I I left the uh, Glim Roads twice, three times. Jumped over to Brendan Ingle. He won't like me saying this, but you know what? Sometimes you have to be cruel to be kind sometimes for yourself. You have to be selfish in that way and look after number one. And yeah. I, I'll tell you what, I split from six, I had six different managers and promoters. You know, I jumped from Barry Ayn to Frank Warren, then back to Barry Ayn and then back to Frank Warren. Yeah. You know, all because I, I you know, I think Barry should have won the pace bids for the European title. Because um, I had to fight an Italian in Italy. Bel Castro. Yeah, Vincenzo Bel Castro. And I got done on points. You know, I got warned about 33 times in 12 rounds. Yeah. And, you know, referee carried on stopping the contest. And I was thinking, great, you know. But, um, but as I say, I jumped from trainer to trainer, manager to manager, just for the for my future, for me, for my... <laughs> Did you ever, did you, if, if you look back on your career now, do, do you think you learned more from any of the trainers you work with? Who was the one do you think you learned the most from? Okay, do you know, do you know what? They've all got a tiny, a, a big, massive influence on my on my style of fighting and boxing. You know, someone like Jimmy Tibbs was fantastic. Absolutely fantastic, Jimmy Tibbs. Loved him. He was great yeah. for your head, wasn't he? Oh, he was an unbelievable trainer. Glyn Rhodes taught me so much in that gym, it, but I could see why he, he knew it all because he got it off Brendan, you know, because Glyn, Glyn was yeah. a great trainer. He'd rubbed off him, but he'd opened his own gym. Uh, but then, I mean, I'd been sparring Nassie Mamet for like, what, six months and yeah. doing hundreds of rounds, so, you know, but you learn because you can see what, what these people have got. Let, let me ask you, what did you think was so good about um, Brendan Ingle? Okay, <laughs> I'll probably get him brought down for this, but you know what, Brendan, he could talk. He was he always made you feel comfortable. He, you know, he, he was a calm, lovely, honest. You could see the guy was. He could he, he could talk. He could talk, and he could talk to you right, right, right to you. You know, honestly, and and you'd believe him. That that's the type of guy he was. But he, in the boxing, for me, I learned a, a lot. I learned more off any other trainer from, and that was off. I learned off Glenn and Brendan Ingle. Both of them have got fantastic ways and fantastic gyms with fantastic fighters. It also struck me that you were quite an Ingle style fighter because you were sort of pretty, you were tall for the weight, loose limbed, bit of flair, you know, good, good head movement. Didn't like to have your hands wrapped around your head. You'd give yourself a bit of room to work with. So it looked to me like you lent yourself to, um, I don't know if you've watched some of Richie's fights in the last couple of days, Michael, but. Look like you might have suited the Ingle style. I don't know Ingle myself. I mean, I know of him. I don't well, know. you know about Nassim Hamid and, and Harold Bomber Graham, right? Obviously, you'll know Harold Graham because you might have fought him at some point. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, you know, remember Harold Graham who had that kind of hands down, reflexive, almost limbo dancer style. And you know about Prince Nassim Hamid enough said yeah. they what they said was that Graham fostered that style and, and spawned all the imitators in the gym and the kids who aspired to him and they were a bit outside the box and left field in their kind of boxing mm -hmm. switch hitters loose limbed you know and relying on reflexes mm -hmm. and then that Nassim Hamid took it through the roof and then th there has since become this blueprint known as the Ingle style and it, it just occurs to me I think Richie was probably quite well suited to that I would have thought Whoever wants to type, respond to that can do so. I, 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 thought, I thought that was a question for Richie. Sorry. I, 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 asked, I asked Richie, the, you know, with Brendan. I love Brendan. And um, I actually really respect his son, uh, Dominic. I think Dominic, he's, yeah. I think Dominic is, 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 a, is a hybrid of, of Brendan for the fact but Dominic seems to have more structure. You know, he has more structure than Brendan. The thing is with Brendan, my, because again, I, I analyze things. I analyzed at the time, I analyzed after I retired. Now, there's a very complex line you draw. Like, when you fight a fighter who doesn't know what the fuck he's going to do 
himself. It's very difficult to work someone out who doesn't know what he's going to do next himself. So you know, so Dominic had this. He he embraced this this um, unorthodox, strange, whatever. But it it I think the tumble of that style came with Pereira. You know, uh, because um, not that it brought the whole style down, but there was something about. Uh, I, I honestly felt, uh, and I love Naz. It's like when Holyfield fought Titan. I thought, you know, Titan's now he's gonna he's gonna he's gonna weather the storm. If you can weather the, the Titan's like a cat, you put him in a corner, it's very dangerous. But if you get past the first two three rounds, and and you're a, I I honestly felt Holyfield would beat him, and he and he beat him well. I honestly felt Barrera would beat. Would beat uh, Nassim uh, based on fundamental boxing, solid kind of. And I, I thought that it. the Hamid star would beat most, but when it comes pro, he might have issues. And I honestly felt the same with Tyson. Well, Richie knows a thing or two about fighting Marco Antonio Barrera because he did so in 1998 on the undercard of Prince Nassim Hamid versus Wayne McCulloch. And, um, I mean, were you disappointed in the way that played out, Richie? Did you, because you look like, to me, like you started pretty good and you had some confidence and self-belief. And then obviously it was the body shots that put Pedro in the third round. But what was your, what, what, how do you feel about the fight all these years later? Okay, Barrera was a clever fighter. He was an experienced fighter. He had four, five, six world title fights by the time I had won. Um, he got in there, you know, I'll, I'll give you a small story. Do you know, I'm in a queue. We're in the queue waiting to book into Bally's Casino, the hotel. Yeah. And um, and he uh, obviously he's in front of us. So me and Glenn and the lads, because I was with a team of boys, just started throwing bits of paper just to upset him. And I'm yeah. you know tiny little, which is which is wrong thing to do. But we're only just not upset him, but you know take his mind off the job. Yeah. And um, and all of a sudden. He must have been with eight people, his family and all he's with. And he stood there waiting when we, we just checked in. And I walk, we're walking past him. He said, excuse me, Richie, can you... um, You, Richie, went to me, sir. I said, yeah. He said, would you mind if you had that photograph with you and your with you and your coaches? Yeah. You know, and I said, absolutely. So I had to stand with him and his family and get a picture taken. And that was and disarming? It was disarming. It was, well... It was really nice of him to do that. He broke my heart for that. But yeah. then, but in the press conference, I'm in a press conference. I've never been in a big press press conference before. It must have been about two or three hundred people there, about six or seven TV cameras. And then um, I stood up, and someone said, well, "Why, you know, how do you plan on doing this fight?" So I said, "Well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to basically knock him out in the end." Then. I sat down, then Pereira got up, and you know what he said? He said, Richie Wenton, he's a great fighter. I will do my best. Yeah. I just, thought, I just, it just blew me away. I just thought, but that's with experience. You, you, you need the experience to get involved in stuff like that. Well, Richie, I didn't have any of it at all. Let me, let me ask you a question, Richie. What do you wish you could have done better as a fighter that could have taken you to win the world championship? Right, like you, you know yourself. You know yourself physically, mentally. What do you think happened that didn't allow you to win the world title? A world title. Um, well, I, I, I'm not saying I'm not. I don't make excuses. Listen, I got beef fair. Yeah, please, hey, excuses are part of the game. People don't want to hear them, but they're not boxes. <laughs> Let's hear. Okay, as far as I'm concerned, do you, do you know um I sort of need. I didn't fight for eighteen months before I had that fight, mm -hmm. so it's so it was quite awkward for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've been inactive. So, I, so I was inactive for that. I should have had a bit more warm, a lot more warmer fights for that, but I didn't get them. Okay, so so you're thinking, so you're thinking that if you would have gotten the warm up fights, that you would have won that title. So it's not, it's not something technically 
was wrong. It was the fact that you didn't have as, as many fights as you should have. You didn't fight frequently enough. Otherwise, if you were fighting frequently enough, you would have beat him. But it's not a technical issue. I'm not saying I would have beat him. I would have given him a, a better fight. Okay, so so a then loyal fight. So then what I'm asking then in turn is what technically, what other attribute would you do you think you wish you had more power, more speed, more accuracy, more dexterity, uh defensive? It's not good head movement, as you can see. It's not stop moving the whole Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but well, so, so what what attribute do you wish you had more of? that you think would have guaranteed you to win the world title and defend it a number of times? What would have made you a more complete fighter, basically? I could say experience, but I'll say with, with Barrera. Um, see, I went from gym to gym, training, sparring, a lot of different... I, I boxed a lot of Mexicans. I boxed people from all over the world. Um, but I think... I, I won't put it down to the training. I'll put it down to... The fact that I just I didn't have the experience. It was down to, a lot of it was down to experience. Um, mm-hmm. Don't so, get me wrong. I was yeah. confident of mm-hmm. putting up a good show and a good fight, a strong uh-huh. fight. But um, I've always believed that you know if I, if I know I'm losing or lost, or I know I'm not going to win the fight. What's the point of me me getting in? You know. Yeah, I understand that. So there isn't there isn't any kind of attribute that you wish you had more of, basically. Like, for instance, not saying experience, because obviously, like, experiences are a part of it. You're absolutely right. But um, let's say he was more susceptible to a left hook or, or an individual was more susceptible to combination punching, but you weren't a combination puncher. And, you were, you know, maybe you hit hard with your right hand, but your left uppercut wasn't significantly good. Or, you know, or you didn't go to the body and stay in there and work on the inside. Are there just... I'm just basically asking you if there are attributes. Like, do you do you feel you were the full package? Not at all. Absolutely you, not. Or do you feel like you had some shortcomings? And if you had shortcomings, what were they? For boxing, what were they? Well, I'll tell you what. I'm not saying I could have took a good shot because I couldn't, right? But I'm not mm-hmm. saying I had a glass chin because I didn't. Mm-hmm. When I got put down, I'd always get back up. Mm-hmm. I'd, never st- I'd never stay down. Yes. I've never been knocked out. Never uh, but, yeah. but I, I, I did. I would always dig in and go forward all the time. Um, as far as I'm concerned, um, from what you've just said, I suppose I, I probably didn't. I probably should have boxed better quality of fighter towards that instead of just having easy warm up fights. The warm up yeah. fights are just to get you the rounds in. But, so, yeah. so basically, you feel you knew everything you needed to know about boxing. You had all the weapons. Let's say you have a cachet, and this cachet, you open it up, and you have to fight a certain fighter, and you have to have a right hand, a left hook, and an uppercut. Another guy, you have to have the double jab. You have to be able to throw in flurries. The other guy, you have to use footwork and, and move your head. You're tell, you're, what I'm asking you is, and what you're saying is, those things don't matter. You could do whatever you had to do to win the fight. But there was something outside of the actual that outside of the actual competition itself that stopped you from becoming world champion. Okay, everyone's got everyone's got a plan before they get in the ring, right? My plan, yeah. my plan for Barrera, right? I'm stumped sat there. I had a plan for Barrera, right? And I'll tell you what it was. Exactly the same as what Junie Jones done. And double yeah. jab right hand left up, move away, move around. Junior Jones was a harder puncher than me. Um, yes. so I, I could see. And he had a classical Tommy Ains type of fight style. Type yeah. of fight style, you know, which which was I didn't have none of that. My my the way I fought is I jab and move, jab and move. And yeah. if, you know, if I have to stand and fight, I will stand and fight. You know, so if unless he knocks me out, I'll knock him out. You know, but I didn't stand and fight um, with Barrera because I knew he was just, well, he hit me with a body shot. You know, I tell you what, I'm in that ring and I'm and I'm hitting him with one or two shots. And he's just putting his hand out. He's just he's just sort of jabbing, but they were light jabs, and I was thinking, what's that? And I think when he does that next, I want to catch it and hit him with the right hand, which I did. Guess what? You know, um all he was doing was was getting his distance. He was getting his distance to where he could catch me. And yeah. that's what he's gonna hit me two fabulous body shots. And I went, oh, wait there. Uh, and I went down on one knee. 
Um, but you know that. But that's that fight. That you, you, you know, obviously I was winded and gutted. Yeah. Well, let's go back a little while to your unfortunately tragic British title winning effort. Um, I was interested um, when we spoke about this on the phone earlier in the week that you said to me when you went into the fight in April 1994 with Bradley Stone for the vacant, I believe it was the vacant, it was the very first inaugural British Super Bantamweight yeah. Championship. You told me you weren't actually expecting to win, which which seems a very strange thing for you to admit, but you said you simply thought I will have the honour of being a British title challenger and you didn't think beyond that. You didn't feel like you were going to win. No. Don't get me wrong, what the British Boxing Board controlled on, they got the top four eight stone ten fighters in the UK and put them put number one against number three, number two against number four. Now I was yeah. ranked number two, Bradley Stone's ranked number one. You no, know, so but Bradley beat Tony Silkston. Um he's 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 died now, hasn't he? He died. Yes, I, I believe he passed away, yes, of years ago, yeah. So uh, and I was due to fight um Henry Armstrong. Well, Henry Armstrong didn't turn up. Um, he, he, he just did, didn't come down to the fight, so I had to get someone else. So I just got someone easy to walk to box, basically. Yeah. Des Gargano. He's yeah. a grim yeah. fighter, though, Des. But, but cut a long story short, um, I didn't expect... All I wanted to do, I wanted to be known as a British title challenger. I thought, that's yeah. great on my record, that. You know, I didn't yeah. realise that. I mean, people were offering me Central Area title fights, and I was thinking, where's the Central Area? What's that all about? Yeah. Don't get me wrong, I'm not looking too high or too low, but I thought the least I could do was fight for the least a British title. So yeah. that's the way, I, that, that was the influence I had in my mind. Um, but as I say, Bradley Stone was a, a, a real great fighter. You know, so I didn't realise, I didn't think I had the opportunity of winning that fight. I mean, I no. remember walking into the arena and the belt was on a chair in the ring. Lonsdale belt. Yeah, the Lonsdale belt. And so, and you know what, when I walked in there, I, I wouldn't look at it because I thought, well, I'm not going to win that, so what's the point of looking at it? So it goes round and, and I thought, I'm, I'm fighting, I'm fighting a London guy in his own town. Yeah, he had, he had promoters, he had his own promoters, his own trainers down there, you know, and he had the crowd. And I thought, well, I've got no, I've only I got Bomber Graham with me. And Frank, I asked Frank Warren to come in my corner, and he said, Yeah, so it'll be yeah. great. Um, and Glenn Rhodes, obviously, yeah, so yeah, but I just, I just thought I'll just do the best I can, you know, and I could see what type of fighter he was because he was a strong fighter, he was a, he was a pressure, pressure fighter coming forward yeah. all the time. Good shots, strong. All that, all I wanted to do was jab and move. I just wanted yeah. to survive twelve rounds. Yeah, which, which um, I sort of did. You know, obviously, just just so Michael is fully aware of this, and I think Gary is. Bradley Stone unfortunately passed away after losing to Richie in a grueling uh, affair. Uh, several days after the contest, he passed away. And uh, there's actually a statue of Bradley Stone outside the old Peacock Gym in Canning Town. So mm -hmm. he's one of those, you know, fistic martyrs uh, Bradley Stone became. Mm -hmm. I've how did it how did it affect you, you know, psychologically, Richie, going forward? Because I've known fighters before who had a, a tragic incident like that on their record, and it affected them in a variety of different ways. Okay, well, I I didn't expect to. Uh... Be asked about it. Yeah, um, but you, you know, um, no one. Not when you walk in, when you get in that ring, no one expects that to happen. That's that's. No one even contemplates that. Mm -hmm. You know, oh. um, boxing is a dangerous sport. But I, I, I would never yeah. dream of doing that or no. being involved in anything like that. And um, and it just blew me away. Um, broke my heart. Broke my mind. I mean, I was in I, the fight after that. I was, didn't know what to do with my career. I'm in a ring with the with the. I read too much of the press as well. You know when you Did read you? too much. Yeah, that, that's what break that broke it up. So um, I yeah. just read too much. I was involved in the media too much, and it didn't. I shouldn't have been. I should have just stayed out of the way. Off. Yeah, and, but it did didn't. you think of quitting? Did you think of retiring and think I ain't going to do this? Absolutely. Anymore? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 
I even I had a fight against some guy named Neil Swain. He was a great yes. fighter. But I was I was better than him. I knew I was better than him. But he, he went in the ring with boxing. And um after four, three, four, five rounds, I was about to nail him and I was winning the fight, don't get me wrong, but I just ended up walking away. I then yeah. walked back to the corner. I just thought yeah. I'm not bothered about it. I walked back to my corner and I was obviously um, highly ranked then. But so just psychologically, you just stopped feeling it. You didn't feel the energy. You didn't feel the urge no. to defend yourself or hit anybody. Both. Yeah. I, di I didn't. I didn't even want to be in the ring. I didn't. I didn't want to even be in the yeah. hall, in the and, arena. I just wanted what, to be home. Where, where do you think that? What did that? What sprout from? That sprouted directly from like you never experienced that before, but you, just because of what happened in the unfortunate circumstance of the fight, where a fighter was. Um, died uh, from being in the ring with you, but it could have happened possibly with anybody that got in the ring with him. Um, do you, I mean, don't you often think like a lot of it is leading up to the fight, the, like really terrible sparring, um, consistent sparring when you're getting hurt and, you, and your chin keeps putting you in the ring? That it's, you know, it all can a lot of responsibility can't ride on your shoulders 100%. I just had to get through it the best way I could, and um, the best way. I did could you get was... over? Did you get over it and start feeling better about your career a, a little later? You know. Um... No, I tell you what I done. I was uh, I was living in a place called Clumpton in Devon, yeah. and um, I was in a little flat, and I was British champion in a little fl in a little yeah. flat, and um, and I had no money. I had nothing, and um, I thought, you know what. I'd just been, I just walked away from Neil Swain's fight. So yeah. I just let that go. Um, but I had no money. So I thought, okay, what I'm going to do now? So I just thought to myself yes. one night, I thought, I either sink or swim here. I'm going to have to fight or not fight. Because I had to fight a mandatory challenger. He was Paul yeah. Lloyd. Yeah. And um, in, in his, I had to fight him in his, his own area of Merseyside or Chester. He was Ellsbury yeah. Port. And he was yeah. from Elton Airport, and he had all the crowd, and he and, and he was an up and coming fighter. He, you know, he he was basically just lost one out of it, a dozen fights, and he was he was ranked to be the best, you know, all that. But I am um, sort of thought, stopped him. <laughs> I watched that today. Yeah, no, he, um, the reason I jumped on the ropes because the crowd booed me, and I, I don't think that's right. You're not allowed. No. You shouldn't. The crowd shouldn't boo a champion fighter. Did you ever get that, Michael or Gary? Did you ever get a hostile crowd that was against you? Uh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, I, I, had one in, I had one in Fiji. Okay. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like that, you do. <laughs> that was really wild. That whole experience is crazy. And in fact, somebody who's worked in my corner who was from Fiji, he was a Fijian gentleman. He was the fourth guy in my corner. There was a title fight. And he actually passed away. He had a heart attack in the eighth round. So during, in oh, the for God's sake! Yeah, he had a heart attack in my corner, and um, really? and I know the whole thing was really bizarre. It was really bizarre. Great gentleman too, really nice gentleman. But that whole thing, we've received death threats beforehand. Yeah. Um, so is he gone? Yeah. yeah. Gary, what about you? Did you do you ever have a hostile crowd, Gary? I had a big, uh, big issue with the uh, the fight before George Collins as an amateur in Coventry. I fought yeah. a guy like uh, it was kind of racially charged. Um, I, I don't know what racism is because I'm so against it. Like for me, it's, uh, it's one of the few things in life that disgusts me. Like when people talk race and stuff i don't even want to deal with it because it just mm -hmm. makes me puke so but i got caught up in this thing my opponent was a black kid and and i was in coventry and it, everyone wanted i guess to fight collins in the final george collins and we got into this thing and i got caught up in it myself not in the racism but in the in the needle and yeah. um i knocked the guy out and I stood over him and kind of did a fucking one of these. <laughs> yeah. And and it went off the crowd. And and uh, I, I had a few of the boys there with me. And 
with the police escorts getting us out the fucking boot like it was insane to get out just to get out the ring and then they got us in the changing room and then they got us out the back door of the fucking venue and then uh we went out to celebrate and uh was in this club and then my mate said oh i think we've got an issue and i guess a lot of the supporters was in the club so we come out the club and there was about fucking 200 guys and four of us and uh my my friend ended up in intensive care with the brain tumor. They, they smashed him. We all got semi smashed a bit. Not me so much. I was lucky. I was. <laughs> I uh, no, I was in the midst of it all. But somehow, me me and my two brothers. It's funny. I I smashed a guy, and when I cracked him, there was a policeman right next to me. So they threw me in a van, which saved me because if they wouldn't have threw me in the van. Did it kill me? Because there's, you know, I, I kind of cracked a guy. They threw no. me in the van. Then my brother cracked another guy. Threw him in, and they threw him in the van. My other mate was unconscious. He got hit with a bat. And we're just about to drive off. And my other brother is fucking in the street on his own. He's dead because if the police, if they drive off, he's on his own with fifty guys. So he just nutted a copper. And the, 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 like he uh, saved his life. And the funny thing was, when we when he went to court, they accepted what he did as to save his life. Do you get me? They they, they he said if yeah, I was yeah. dead, so, was really so they kind of let it slide. But yeah, it was very very scary. You know, you get caught up in these situations, but that, you know that was a scare scare scary time. But. You know the thing is with boxing, it's emotional. It's it's you know it's a fight. It's you get caught up in it, and um, and yeah, and, and the crowd gets caught up in it, and uh, it's exciting, but it's also it can be pretty scary and pretty stupid, you know. Ben, let me can I ask um Richie a question? Why not? That's what we're here for. Okay, well, thank you, Ben. I saw you were about to purse your lips, and I was like, wait, uh, you know, you know how to read me now. You know my, you know my stuff. <laughs> I was like, purse or wallet? With your lips, okay. So the bad joke, but I'm from. Okay, so oh, yeah, I got, I got it. Yeah, yeah cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Richie, how many times? Now this is, you know, and this is actually for everybody on this panel. I, I could adjust this to everybody. How many times have you been rocked or dropped or wobbled in boxing, sparring, amateur fights, and actual fights? You speak very clear, and you think obviously very clear, and it doesn't appear to be any cobwebs whatsoever. Like you have no residual. Unlike some people from boxing, unlike some of us, yeah. Yeah, Gary's <laughs> all right. <laughs> like Ben, Ben got hit with so many uppercuts he can't grow hair. It's crazy. Yeah, exactly. It's, that is actually there is a correlation. It's been proven in studies. So don't take the piss. <laughs> so, so, um, do you could you tell me off the top of your head how many times you've been like hurt, buzzed, rocked, dropped, anything like that? We, could you give me a number? I think, I think that's an occupational hazard, not in our sport. Yeah, it is actually absolutely. You know, so, I think everyone, everyone, most people, obviously being put down or shot yeah. or or rocked. Yeah, you know, yeah. because the, obviously you know the way the brain works. You, you yes, know, you, exactly. you've got fluid mm -hmm. around your brain you mm -hmm. take a big bang on that boom exactly. it shuts down that's yep. what makes you go that knocks you out that's how exactly. you get that but yep. i mean i've chose to go down only in one fight and that was Barrera. that yeah. was the only chance i just you know said i'm, I'm down yeah. here you yeah. took a break yeah no, that's smart you're smart but, to do that but i but i've done the last probably in my last two fights i sort of just um I went back to corner and I said, well, I'm not going to win this fight because I could see they were too strong. I wasn't wasn't as good then. And, and I just thought, you know what? I'll just leave it now. And it sort of walked away and then um, just stayed in the corner and just looked at the rest of my life, not where I was at the time. Yeah. So, so um, but do you, like, for instance, I could say that I could count on a lot of hands how many times I've been rocked, buzzed. I'm talking sparring. Like in, in in professional fights, I think I've been dropped maybe like uh I don't twice know. by Barkley, right? Twice, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't need your help, thank you. I'll figure it out. 
Around Barclay, wow. Can I just buy Barclay for that? I don't need your help. I got that. I've got, I got a compilation video I keep for when I feel sorry. <laughs> I'm sure you do. <laughs> it's, all, it's all love. So. Keep me in my place. No, but yeah. I think I think overall, uh, it's going to be somewhere between, as a professional, between 10 and 20. I'm yeah. sure. Uh, you yeah. know, because it's been multiple times by, you know, Barkley and, and Tate. I got dropped by Hearns. So right yeah. away there, yeah, that's five. Yeah, yeah, maybe like around 10, 10 yeah. times. But as an amateur, I've been dropped too. And, and in sparring, it's happened. And um, and so I'm thinking like anywhere, like every time you get hit, that's a concussion. It's not just every time you get dropped, you're concussed. So you only have a certain amount of concussions you can really get before you start suffering different types of, you know, maladies and stuff. So I'm, I'm asking you, do you have an idea how many times you've been hit and... Let's say put over. Okay, the only, the, only, the only person really that I've been shook with in a ring was um, a guy named Pat Caldell. You know him, don't you, Pat yeah, Caldell? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I sparred him in, um, in Birmingham and, mm -hmm. um, and I sort of had a flash knockdown, you, you know, when we sparred. But I don't think he meant to do it. Obviously, he was a world class fighter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then, but um, but I never get that in sparring because I wouldn't go out to fight in a sport. That's mm -hmm. just wasting. I, I to me, that's mm -hmm. wasting you, your life away. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, absolutely. I just I think it's wrong. Yeah. People coming in, you know. I mean, I was I sparred Michael Gomez and yeah. Anthony Fornell one time, and they, they were they were still, um, they were just turning pro. Yeah. And I went down the gym, I was in the gym with them and they started spawning. And I thought after the first round, Michael Gomez was trying to punch holes at me. I was thinking, what's that all about? So I just obviously he didn't because it didn't allow him to. But uh, yes. as far as I'm concerned, that's not how you're supposed to spar. Sparring's no. learning, you're learning and you you getting fit and getting strong. Do you know Brendan Ingle and Glenn Rhodes' gym? Body sparring. Oh, they, I've, I've sparred Johnny, I've sparred all the boys there, Johnny Nassi and Mohammed, John, all the boys, Ryan Rhodes, and do you know what? It's all body sparring. Is that the way it was for you as well, Gary, in that camp? Body sparring a lot. Uh, yeah, but I actually refused it. Did you? You said, we're, 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 we're not, this is not, you know, this is not a game we're going to have. Yeah, yeah, because I, I was, ex I went to America early in my career and, and as I understand what Richie's talking about, but for me, I, I, I like to go full out. Uh, I never wore very rarely. I wore headgear when I sparred because for me, headgear was a, a complete fucking wreck of time because yeah. wow. I, I make people miss by an inch, you know, and the headgear hits you. So, yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, the, the damage with head care, I mean, we all know the medical, you get hit with a, with a shot and the brain spins, and so it, it spins with or without head gear. The only thing head gear really does is prevents cuts, I think. But That's exactly. 100%. The problem, the problem with head gear for me is it's this big, the target's twice as big, so if I make you miss, and, and, and the thing is for, for me, I want to make you miss with millimeters and and be able to come back with a shot. So I I, I never sparred with headgear. Um, my opponent normally had headgear because that would at least if we classed head, someone's got like he's. Exactly, he's yeah. But, yeah. but um, I, I got exposed to the Amer American style, and and for me, I, I preferred to to have a full on spa so that. It wasn't a shot when I got on a ring, and you know it was like I, I got used to it full on. And um, in my career, Eubank put me over with a flash knockdown, and then um, I got dropped by an Argentinian, which it looks pathetic, really, because he he touched me. It was like a, a lot like him chinny, and I'd never been dropped in my career, but it, it was actually a slip. But it's a it's a weird. I knew a slip, but. It, it, you, you couldn't tell because I remember looking at the frame on the screen. You couldn't see my legs, but I kind of put one leg on top of the other and he just skimmed me and I went over and everyone went, what the fuck? But I was not a hurt at all. But if, but technically I went down with him. I went down with Eubank. I got clipped with a shot with Tommy Hearns in the gym in Detroit. 
I got rocked a little bit, um, but it didn't go over. I just got, I remember walking forward and my legs were stayed still. I kind of, so I got this numb. But I think only in my whole career, in 20 years, I think four times I ever got hurt. Um, as far as any kind of stunning sensation, I was pretty lucky, I guess. Uh, I, I, How many times in your career, sorry, you kind of went out? Yeah. Twice in in the ring, and, and maybe twice in the gym in a, in a twenty year well, you know, an eighteen year wow. career, and I never really got got hit that much. So, so honest. like two concussions, that's it. Like two, not even concussions. I, I got hit with the shot. That, yeah, like, that I felt. You know what I mean? It's like wow. uh, I, I I remember, um, you know, you you get hit with a shot and you go, whoa, that kind of sensation. Um, yeah. I, I obviously got caught a few times, but never, never hurt at all. So, uh, and I put that down to luck. Not, not, you know. Obviously, I was a kind of a def not defensive fighter, but but I had good reflexes. But it happens, and so I don't. I don't look. I, I don't say it in 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 a way in which I was good. It's just you know you get caught. Anyone gets caught. It just happens. Yeah, yeah. I was lucky enough that I actually didn't really get caught that much in my life. So, um, yeah, maybe four times in and out the in and out the two in a fight and two in the gym. Okay. So um, it's funny because I was speaking to a, a gentleman today, Mike Colbert, who you know from up yes, yeah, Fort, uh, Fort Duran, Fort Duran, yes, good fighter. And um, he was a he was a teammate of Marvin Hagler's. So he trained the same gym anyway. And you know, I told you that story of the one kid who I thought who said he had dropped Hagler. Johnny was, Banks Walker. Yes, yes, Johnny Banks Walker. And there was another kid by the name of um, Bob Patterson. Yeah. Who was a middleweight who also uh, was said, was known to have dropped Hagler at sea. Found out in the last few days, and um, and so I asked him, and he said, "No, there's absolutely not." He knows the guy who he was, and 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 it's just it's amazing to me how individuals can go through. I mean, it just must be the way you're. You know what's funny? I never got hurt. Like, uh, like I I got hurt with the uh, Zoom and Nelson sparring, but yeah. but it, but it was my arms who kept fucking hit my arms my elbows and my hips so it wasn't it was it wasn't on the chin but he was banging me on my arms my shoulders my like he hit me on my my um you know on my uh, what, what's this muscle the uh i said tricep. Bicep. like he fuck it i remember the day after the spa I, I took a shower and i looked and i was completely black and blue my arms my hips my you know so yeah, they, they you you can get beat up, but not always on the chin. You know what I mean? He 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 was just a fucking nightmare. He used to hit you everywhere. Uh, so 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 Richie. So you you feel like you pretty much you know you've dodged the. You, do you do anything right now to stay current, to stay active, to you know to you don't worry about your brain or nothing like that. Like a lot of fighters should. I know a lot of fighters. Do you continue to work out? Yeah, oh God, no. Jesus, I've, I've done all my training. But as far as I'm concerned now, do you know where I go on walks? I, I enjoy the life I live. You know, um, I go on walks. I, sometimes I go running. Sometimes I go down the gym, look after the kids. Yeah. I'm in the gym with the kids in the sparring. In fact, listen to this. I was in my mate's gym, Regan Denton's gym, uh, a few months ago. And I, and I said, well, I've got these these three kids. These, they're up to 16. But they do... One or, one or two of them were bigger than me. And I thought, okay. So I said to him, I said to one of the kids, I said, if you don't punch hard, if you don't let, let it all go, I'll, I'll I'll catch you with shots. Because I don't hit kids. You know yeah. what I mean? I'll just, I'll just slip and I was teaching them. And that. Next thing, I'm in the ring with them, sparring. And yeah. bloody hell. I said, boom. I, I thought, this guy's going to knock me out in a minute. One of the kids, and I thought... I said, that's it, that's it. Yeah. Well done, good lads, that's it. You know, yeah, walked yeah, away. Yeah. I couldn't do that. I didn't walk. Yeah. But yeah, no, I, I, the, the worst thing I do now is uh, is go walking. I don't mind the you know, walking here and there, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but 
Do you miss your suitcase? Boxing. I think everyone's got to be aware that um, that if you're, as Gary said before, you know, he, he, he spars. I was in the Eastwood gym and, you know, every single six days a week, I'd be terrified. Sat next to Paul Hodgkinson, sat next to Dave Boy McCauley. I'd have to be in a ring with the both of them. Um, and you know what? Run through rounds and they would look to punch holes in you. You know, I had to oh, just, fuck. I, I basically survived. I survived. What do, you, what, do you, what do you miss most about the game? It's fitness. Michael? I actually, actually miss the fitness. You know, going to the gym in a routine twice a day. Sometimes, you know, I'd start mm -hmm. training at 7 o'clock in the morning till about mm -hmm. 9. Then I'd go to the gym about 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, do sparring. <laughs> you know, that's mm -hmm. the way, that was the routine I had every so six days a week. Running, mm -hmm. then I'd go for the jog of the night or a mm -hmm. walk. Um, as I say, boxing's a, I don't know, I mean, it's a great sport, but it's a dang, it's a hard, dangerous sport. It's hard on us fight as fight ex-fighters. Right? That's why it's better when you start younger, right? Because Mike, Michael, Michael, what do you miss about your career? Yeah. Uh, I don't know that I miss anything really, because it was like from day one, it was very traumatic. And so, and so, and it stayed that way all the way through. I, you know, no matter what level, there was a lot of trauma at every level. It was, everything was a fight to get everywhere, to get, to get over to the East Coast, to get to New York, to get to the Canadian title, the Pacific Northwest title. Everything was tra traumatic. And so now, when I, I, I'd stopped fighting when I was like almost twenty six years old, and that's pretty early. Um, I had to stop because of my eye, and yeah. Um, I was just I was just burned out. Like I just didn't have that fight in me anymore, and I and I didn't miss it. I mean, there are some, yeah, there are times when you're frustrated and you want to like just crack somebody, and you say, "Oh, you wish you were fighting again." But generally, I haven't looked back from from 26 years of age or 25, whatever. It's funny. Someone asked me the other day, "What do you miss the most?" And I, and I thought about it. Two things: winning. Not every day you win, right? You know, whether it be a fucking so winning the, the actual art of winning something where you actually win. And the other thing for me, I miss the taste of food when you're really hungry. Uh -huh. Yeah, when, when you when you suddenly treat yourself. <laughs> you know, you're like you really well, you really get that fucking like you're starving. You. <laughs> it, the funny thing is that I, I tell people. So, you know, I, I remember being in the gym a dream about a milkshake when I'm cutting weight, I think a fucking strawberry shake and a burger, right? As soon as you get the scales and you can have it, I don't want it. The mind yeah. is so fucked up, right? Yes. Like I dreamt about it for a week. I'm gonna have the fucking amazing fucking shake with and then I'm gonna and then you get on the scales and then you get off and you've made weight and you I don't do you want a shake? Yes, I'm not no, I'm fine. It's, it's Rookie a, hadn't used to have a fry up, didn't he? On the morning of a fight, Rookie, once he made weight the day before, um, he would have a big, massive fry up in, in the calf on the morning of a world title fight. That was his thing. I don't know. I don't know what it's, you think about that. In my career, like now we have all this sports medicine and, uh, you know, uh, strength and conditioning. I used to run at five, five in the morning, like five, six in the morning. I'd come back at, let's say, I ran at six, I'd come back at seven have a full English, you know? Uh, and then, I, you know, I'd go for a walk for 20 minutes after the fucking breakfast, go to bed maybe for a couple of hours, get up, rain. But, um, yeah, and and then I would do that. I, I would then be cooked. The, 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 the lunch and the dinner were much more, you know, strict. And I'd do it. I'd have my full English look in the morning, many times and then you know about two three weeks out i would start to cut 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 and it'd get very strict because it, it, it junior middleweight hurt me i'm six two yeah, so yeah. To, to make 11 stone was not easy i walk around 12 12 and a half stone and i'm lean at 12 and a half stone mm -hmm. so to get down to 11 stone was was tough for me but it was the, that was my best weight but it was a process you know um yeah. I would get down to with with the good diet and I'd get down to eleven and a half so and then the last week, the last six, seven pounds was tough. You know, so, swilling water and spitting it out day before. Yeah. 
Yeah. But, it's, it's a fun game. So, Richie, um, as we're drawing to a close, I'm very mindful of the fact that we've focused on a fight that you lost to Marco Antonio Barrera and a fight that had a tragic ending. And I don't want that to be all she wrote for this particular episode of Sugar Silk and Stretch. So can I ask you um, what your proudest achievement was from your whole career in the ring? Okay. Boxing Paul Lloyd. Yeah. Because you know what? That was He was a mandatory challenger. He was a great fighter. And I had Evan against me. But you know what? I pulled out the bag. I actually won the fight, but won the, got the Lonzo belt. Yeah, and, right. Uh, absolutely outright and you know what um i sort of stood up like you stood up and to be counted wanted to be counted you know and i realized that then and thought there we go now let's let's move forward and see where we go in this world uh, and but yeah, is, yeah but yeah but, sorry go on keep going keep going yeah i mean the crowd all booed me and so on and so forth and i thought well you know, obviously, the only way he's going to beat me now is by me getting knocked out. So I stood and fought, and it's not a fight that I fight. I'm, I'm, a, I'm sort of like a box fighter. Yeah. But I ended up just toe to toe, stood in the ring, stood in the middle of the ring, and thought, oh, "Come on, you know, if you're going to win, you're going to win. If you're not, you're not." So I just stood there, but I didn't think I was going to win that fight. That's the reason why I um. That's another fight I didn't think I was going to win. Don't yeah. get me wrong. You're supposed to listen. If I tell the fighters all the time, go in there because you can easily win that fight. But you know, with myself, I'm, I'm doing the opposite of what I thought. Yeah. So I'm t I'm telling them to do the opposite. Uh, you know. But once yeah. I did get in that ring, I wasn't nervous. I just treat it as a sport, but with yeah. a lot more power. Uh, so that's the only way I could feel better. So you kind of caught like lightning in a bottle. You wish. You would have approached more of your fights like that? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. don't get me wrong. I mean, the Barrera fights, <laughs> Barrera's a great fighter. That's all I'll say. You know, I'll, I'll never bring the guy down. I mean, I, but I boxed people like Mark Two Sharp Johnson. Do you know him? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Cool. of course. I, I, I boxed Mark. And um, yes, it might have been his second fight of my eighth fight. But you know what? I, I beat I beat Mark, but he, what a fantastic fighter! So I'd say he was probably the best fighter I've been in the ring. Yeah, yeah, I've ever Barrera. Yeah, he's great. Yeah, more than the Barrera. Barrera's a yeah. tough Mexican that stands there. Body shots, head shots, good footwork, good strong. You know, forward pressure fighter. Not 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 a guy that's going to be dancing around. Whereas Johnson, <clears> what a <throat> fantastic! He hit me three times before I even put me hand put me hands up. When the first yeah. bell went, that's how fast he was, and his skill, his speed, mm -hmm. was second to none. And you know, I, I, I still admire him now. You know, he's, he's, he was a great, great fighter. He's been all but forgotten as well, hasn't he, Michael? It's interesting because he he was a serious pound for pound contender. Inevitably, he wasn't really getting the exposure or the credit because he's a smaller guy, and that's just the the unfairness of boxing and of life. But Mark Two Sharp Johnson, it, it's one of those guys who really has been all but forgotten, even in the circles, nearly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, hardly talked about anymore. I mean, it happens with. I remember when uh, Bernard uh, Bernard Taylor, yeah, the Express, yeah, incredible fighter coming out of the amateur. BT Express. The BT he, Express. Remember when he fought Barry McGuigan? He stood McGuigan on his head. Yeah, four or five rounds, and yes. then Barry started to get to him, and then he, yeah. he capitulated somewhat disappointingly for some people. Some people were questioning his heart, you know. Yeah, yeah. But exposition provided a pretty compelling argument that Bernard was in a lot of distress, some was dehydrating, and you know was having a lot of problems, and he did, he did the right thing pulling him out. But yeah. but I remember thinking, what a beautiful boxer he was when he, yes. in the first few rounds of the McGuigan fight. And he drew, don't forget, with Eusebio Pedroza too. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> guys like that, he, that, that was a nearly world champion, fellas, back in the day. And I know I go on about it, but these days, it's like every, every I, I, I want to use the C word, but it's like every guy's a world champion. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, and at least... Richie owns the Lonsdale belt outright. That is a legacy, and, and that that's, is an achievement. That's a beautiful belt. I can't believe, like, everyone's title belt should look like the Lonsdale belt. Do there you, you go. Do you still have it, Richie? Oh, absolutely, yeah. 
Yeah, it's, we're uh, you, know, so you, get a, you get a pension, right? Like a pound a month or something. What is it? <laughs> is that you don't know. Are you thinking of coming back, Gary? Okay. No, but the, it, is it true that there's a that you, you get a pension with it? Oh God, no! I wish. No, I mean, I wish someone told me you got a pension. You're right, like Gary. It. They did say that, Gary. They did say that, but yeah. we're hearing it from the horse's mouth. It's not true. Wait, Gary, no, you don't have a Lonsdale belt. You know, I, no, I, I won it, I defended it, and I, I, I only had to defend it one more time, and uh, to, win it to win it outright, and uh, I, I was, I was persuaded by Frank Warren because he had another junior midweight, Tony Collins, at the time. Give it up, let Tony George fight for it, the world titles, and. I gave it up, which I should never have given up. I should have had one more defense because, to, to be honest, it's it is my favorite belt. Um, yeah, beautiful, wow. and uh, I wish I would have had one more. I even think now, with my age, I want to go back and fight some motherfucker. <laughs> and get so, yeah, <laughs> I thought you were going to do it for pension, Gary. But just to make things month. clear, Michael might not be, might not have realized that you have to win three British title fights, or nowadays you actually have to defend it three times yeah. before you keep it for your property forever. But I and that's my that's one regret that I gave it up. I should never give it up, but I, I gave it up. I fought, I, I, I beat Cooper, and then I fought Derek Wormold, who was a, he was a very good fight. He was unbeaten when I fought him. Yeah, I'm, I, I knocked him out and around. Um, and I should have done it again, just because at that time I just needed one more win, but I, I gave it up, you know, under the advice of bad advice of someone. But you know, um, it's a beautiful belt, and um. I'm sure Rich is very proud to have it. You know, I wish well, I had that. Well, in, since 1909, there's only 161 of them ever yeah. been won. Yeah. See, I'm so stupid, but I'm still mad at myself. <laughs> yeah. you know, 161, not 162. Go like this. Well, it might be 162 now, but you know what? It it's could have been, but it was never going to be, right? Well, so. on, the subject, on the subject of legacy, as we're drawing to a close now, and I want to draw to a close... Even if Silk suddenly says like, he's got another half an hour in him with the next with the next thing he <laughs> leads us down, because um, I don't want to keep Richie forever. Richie, so in terms of legacy, uh, I believe you're thinking of writing a memoir. Well, I'm going to do a biography. I think, um, obviously, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about doing something yet, and um, I think um, I think people need to know what it's like to walk into a ring. Yeah. People you know, what I like about, you know what I like about you, Richie? You're you're extremely humble, but um, you're extremely inspiring because he's so honest and he's not afraid to say, you know, I'm not, I knew I was going to get beat this night. Or I knew it. It's like most fucking people, <laughs> they feel shit and they say, I was going to do this. He, I, I don't think I've ever met a man who's as honest as Richie that yeah. listen, <laughs> listen to him tonight. No, no, listen, no, listen, listen to him tonight. It, it's, it's impressed me a, a great deal. Obviously, I, I was uh, I liked him as a fighter when back in the day, but to actually get to know him a little bit today, it's inspiring yeah. that, that someone can be just so honest and uh, open and uh, no ego and say it the way it is, and uh, I think you should write something because I think that you will inspire people. Because um, we're not all supermen. Everyone thinks like it's it's the it's the it's the dream you cannot have. But when, when I hear Richie talk, kids will say, "You know what? He he he's like me." So maybe I can do it too. And I think what? you'll inspire people because because you know. There's this myth that we're all supermen. We're not supermen. We're just regular guys. And I think Absolutely. Richie is a, a great ambassador for, for that. Oh. So I, I, I'll be the first one to buy it if you ever Well, write it. on that subject, I, I believe I, I did say to Richie, perhaps we could make this little small announcement. Not that we have a massive um, viewership on this show yet. But Richie had called me early in the week and asked me if I would collaborate with him on, on the book and help him put it together, which I consider a great honour. It's something that there was no way I was going to turn him down on that particular account. So we're going to get our heads together in the next few months, however long it takes. Um, we're going to go through that process and, uh, and we will get the Richie Wenton story in all its glory down in, in some readable format. So for anybody, viewers who are still watching us, watch this space. Um, 
Richie, it's been, it's been a great pleasure to have you on the show. So we've known each other kind of a long time, but it, it's been nice to make this proper connection, have a conversation with you. You're going to get sick of the sight of me in the next several months because we're going to be collaborating <laughs> on your book. Um, and um, thank you for coming along. Well, can I just say, good fan where do you know what, Michael, it's been a pleasure. Um, you've got actually got um, one of your families living in Speak, haven't you? Uh, in, sorry, in Nedley. Is it your nephew? Uh, yes, 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 yes. My um, my mom's sister's kids. Yeah. Uh, my mom's wow. brother's kids. I'm sorry. So yeah, <laughs> they live um over in in Nedley. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, yeah it's a pleasure meeting you, and it's a pleasure, it Gary. It's, it's an honor meeting you. You know, you're both great guys. Um, Thanks, obviously, I'm, I'm good friends with uh, with Ben. So you know, but keep in touch, and we go from there. God right, bless. Thank you. All the best, Richie. It's been my honor and my pleasure. Big Thank pleasure. you for watching. Thank you. you know, both, I just want to say in closing, you two were really disciplined uh, this time, by the way. When it's three of us, it's a, it's a free-for-all sometimes. But you two were very <laughs> mindful of the fact we have four talking heads on the screen. I thought you both yeah. excelled yourselves with restraint and professionalism. So take a bow. <laughs> in the meantime, everybody else, be lucky. Keep punching. Don't do anything we wouldn't do. Thanks, Simon. Cheers, guys. Peace out.